Okay. Alrighty. Um, so kicked off recording. Let me just share screen. Okay, so I guess uh, hopefully my screen's showing up on everyone's end. Um, so again, you know, welcome SIG API group. Um, again, try to, try to do these as regular as possible and as needed without kind of like um, wastefully kind of having them, but um, it was, seemed good to kind of squeeze one in this week um, as there's some decent churn and updates happening on the uh, various SDKs. Um, right now, it's kind of assumed that uh, kind of the core SDK efforts are really, I mean, we kind of stated before that like the JavaScript one is kind of, as of now, kind of been like the leader for like supported one. And the one we'll kind of be using as, you know, some gating factor of, you know, quality and support as we go through releases and new features. Um, but obviously, there's been uh, an uptick in participation on the Java side uh, through Shintat and some of the guys on his team. Um, and then Alex um, had started digging into the Python side. So now it's kind of shaping up, you know, JavaScript still being kind of like leader. And then Java uh, kind of kept trying to catch up and update. And then Python will emerge hopefully in the next month or so. And then um, uh, that's kind of, again, we kind of look at it as those are the core ones. Obviously, there's other people on here. So if, if people chime in uh, when we get to discussion time, if you're either participating in existing efforts or uh, working on some other languages or looking to work on some other languages. Um, so yeah, so mostly today, uh, it was really just kind of get like a, a quick update um, on kind of this, the state of, of, of the SDKs. And then really just any quick discussion or long if people bring up other topics. Um, and really the only discussion topic, just based on some, some posts from Greg earlier in the Slack, um, is just, was just kind of like a heads up of like versioning of the SDK. Um, and actually I'll just add to this. Um, You know, versioning of server product in general. I'll have some notes. We've been talking about just some general versioning going forward um, into Dragon release and afterwards. Um, so I guess, um, let me see who's on. I don't think Greg's making it on, uh, but if we go to participants, uh, anyone from, uh, oh, I see Steven. Steven, do you want to uh, talk about any updates? Um, on your guys' end, I know you guys kind of posted, I added some notes here just from what Greg um, had posted, but I don't know if you want to talk to any of the points. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm just trying to grab uh, Greg's in. Um, he's probably uh, still remember the, the old time because there's a time change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so basically um, last week we, um, we merged quite a few uh, pull requests, so all the call, all the cow uh, features been merged, and that should be fixed now. Um, the outstanding uh, today we we made a new release, um, so it's adding um, some bug fixes and adding the uh, delegated harvesting. Um, yeah, and they also there's some like a uh, old uh, issue list uh, bug list we fixed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I just pulled up the uh, the commit list and see from you know just in the last you know roughly twenty four hours. Uh, yeah. Range from from you guys. Um, so obviously anyone who's interested, you know, you can just hop on 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 that. Um, and then along those lines, I guess I also saw the notes. Uh, whereas uh, you know we basically are on you know version zero point eleven now. Um, yeah. Um, that I think. Uh, I'm I'm not quite sure uh, what exactly um, Greg and David they talked about the versions, uh, but previously we we're on the uh, zero ten point three I think, um, because it's a it's kind of like a completed uh, catapult call release, so they think maybe just increase the uh, you know the mid uh, version number to eleven. Okay. 
yeah um, that, I mean, that, that, that's my my opinions but um greg and Derry has been uh, discussed about the motions um, yeah there was just kind of like greg node basically said let me just pull it up uh let's see basically it was saying uh in in discussion yeah i mean I think some of it we haven't been too um i going to talk about this a little bit later, might as well just cover it now. So yeah, basically from a versioning perspective, we haven't been as, uh, you know, it's like we're not following really specific like Semver kind of style support yet. We might not ever yeah. be like super strict, but, um, and um, I don't know how many people are either familiar or not familiar with like Semver kind of uh, for uh, for versioning and support. Anyone, anyone who's maybe not, if you just like maybe drop a message or something. I can just talk to it real quick. Yeah. So it's a major dot minor dot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me just pull this up. Uh, yeah. Where's the, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of, you know, let me say de facto standard, but you know, a lot of people try to like, you know, support this. We definitely haven't been along these lines, but we, we've talked about it and we're going to be kind of like moving towards it more, especially going into Dragon and out. Um, and so uh, the, the, the kind of the delta with us right now is it's almost like we're treating, you know, minor is almost like our major um, in a way. So like if you look at what we're doing on server, even though we're not following anything strictly yet, um, Server is like, you know, zero one, zero two, zero three. That's like alpaca, bison, cow. And clearly we're having breaking changes in these current releases. So we're kind of almost using the minor as the major on the current setup. Uh, we haven't talked about it, but in theory, you could see us saying like, okay, we're going to go to one dot X. Once we say, um, you know, uh, we get to a quote unquote catapult V1 that is like truly like, not that it's never going to change, but uh, the 1.x branch will be compatible on all future changes until we get to a 2x. That's kind of stuff we've just casually talked about. Um, obviously, that's for the server, and then the SDKs are kind of like, you know, obviously related. Um, but, you know, I think in general, we can kind of start to, um, obviously, there's, you know, different languages and different dependency systems and versioning numbers and how things are resolved. Um, I don't think we need to be too strict to cause, like, confusion, but I think as long as we're, we're doing some sane um, compatibility. So I, I think, you know, bringing up the subject now with the JavaScript one and saying like, oh, okay, you know, to these breaking changes, let's rev it from 10 to 11. Uh, yeah, I think it makes sense. Um, some things, so basically what we're kind of talking about doing currently, things have kind of been versioned independently. We're, we're going to probably be versioning at least the server and the API gateway, um, the REST server uh, together going forward. Uh, coming out of Dragon. Um, again, I think it's fine that the SDKs kind of carry on their own. Uh, it's actually, you know, unless people completely, uh, depending on when they're starting, we don't want to muck too much with uh, drastically changing versioning numbers, obviously, given how dependencies might be defined in certain languages. But um, anyways, um, I think it's good, um, oh. that conversation. Um, okay. Might, might, might be good to, to consolidate the uh, the change note or release note because uh, we've got quite a few things going on. Get the different languages, SDKs, and the rest, the uh, the CLIs. So maybe just have like a centralized consolidated release note so we know which version is you know for what 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 has been changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we kind of have uh, we have some version of that now. Uh, David has actually been kind of, uh, kind of, you know, good at marshalling that stuff and kind of like, let's say cracking the whip on everyone to kind of set, because we're constantly trying to like raise the bar, let's say, and constantly, you know, continually improving. So that's definitely something that, um, uh, from like release notes and compatibility and versioning and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's definitely like a goal and then always, always kind of improving along those lines. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, just a little bit more, um, update. So I think, uh, we, we were quite productive last week. Um, so we got like, a, uh, another big, uh, pull request pending for review. So Greg's going to be review the, uh, expose, um, uh, the serialization method. And that one is a big one. 
Uh, don't worry about the red cross because it's, uh, it's depending on the, uh, the library update. So uh, once that's done, that could give the developers a very handy tools to serialize or deserialize the uh, transaction data from memory um, of. Yeah. Is there going to be any discussion on the naming schemes for those? Because I've already implemented in my SDK similar functionality, but obviously since mine is um, not official in any capacity yet, I would like to just make sure that um, I adopt whatever naming scheme is adopted by the core SDK. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we'll have a look. On, is that on the uh, the Java repo? Uh, Python. Perfect. Yeah, Python. mine is the Python. Yeah, so we'll yeah. actually have, Alex, we'll have you give an update in a second so you can kind of talk more to that. Cool. And actually, if you wanted, you can maybe, we can pass sharing over to you. You can share your, uh, uh, you know, GitLab repo that where you have stuff stashed now. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, uh, definitely, it's, it's good to, uh, you know, we can, you know, try to coordinate, obviously, on, on naming and stuff. Um, and uh, so anyways, yeah, 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 definitely. Thanks for bringing that up. Wonderful. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, I guess any, uh, any questions or anything on the uh, JavaScript side for, for Stephen? Anyone have? Okay. Um, I guess let's... Uh, we can go um, into Java real quick. So let me see, who do we, uh, Wayne, I see you, obviously we can have you kind of just give a quick update on your cat buffer and testing stuff. I don't see if uh, Shintat and any of the other guys from his team. Uh, Hi. Let me see. Oh, there's. Hi, hi. this is, uh, this is uh, Ravi here. Oh, yeah, hey Ravi. Yeah. Yeah, so actually, if you want to make sure you have a give an update um, on your end. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Shintat uh, missed the, um, uh, what he called seeing that the, this call has been actually one hour earlier for us here because of the time zone, uh, you know, what he call it's brought forward like one hour earlier for us here. Yeah, yeah, we ended up having, that was, again, kind of uh, some confusion this week and then time change in the U.S. on top of it. Um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, if you just want to kind of give, give a, a quick this, I know you guys have been, uh, you know, uh, working away. He had messaged me a little bit yesterday, and then I saw uh, Wayan had posted, and then there's you know a couple of replies on the Slack today. But maybe just give you know a couple quick minutes uh, overview, kind of uh, uh, your guys, you know, if yeah. things and kind of uh, how this week and going into next week look. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, yeah. So basically, um, I've been working on the the SDK. Um, Shintat was uh, working on the cat buffer. Um, uh, he he took a certain approach, and um, and now Vion has uh, taken over the cat buffer, and yes, uh, I think Vion can can talk about it later. Uh, and and I'm. Um, also working on the mosaic namespace split um, and the the alias uh, changes um, still kind of um, working on that um, and there have been a couple of pull requests um, for some you know some minor changes um, and there was one on the sha two five six change uh, that's still pending a merge um, and um, I, I've started looking into the cat buffer generated code uh, to test it in the SDK. Uh, so I'm hoping to work uh, with Vion on that. Um, so yeah, so 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 basically that that's that's about it. I, I think one of the issues, uh, one of the things that um, we kind of uh, uh, have is that there's only one person that uh, can actually do a commit, um, sort of do what they call merge it to the master. So, yeah, yeah, basically do the approval. Yeah, so basically what we can do is, um, is I know you guys, um, actually we got to go back and review, I'd ask Shintat, basically identify like, kind of like a point, you know, and maybe if that's going to be you, like are you kind of going to be like the lead on your guys' end? Like whoever's kind yeah. of, yeah. so then what we can do is set it up 
um, out of band, um, we you know we can message and set it up so you can kind of be like a, a reviewer and approval for the uh, for the for the Java side of things. And pretty much we want to have like one or two gating people that are like dedicated to it, and then they can take and be the uh, the you know funnel for anything that's coming in, and then we kind of uh, expand it as we need. Okay, so yeah, that sounds, sounds good. Um, cool. Yeah, because there are a few pull requests pending. Um, so it, it yeah, <laughs> ho hoping to see those uh, merged. And so we can sort of uh, proceed further with, you know. Okay, nice. Um, I had one question um, for, Wayne or Ravi, anybody, somebody was asking me earlier today if there was any kind of timeline on the Java SDK when it might be up to speed. I know it's a lot of work to get something up to speed, but I really didn't have any idea what to tell them. So do we have any kind of general idea, maybe, how long it could take to get Java up to speed? Um, up to, to for what? We call to get it to cow compatibility. Um, I guess our target should be like end of this month or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There was another developer too, but he missed the time change. He told me he was going to come today, but um, got confused. So I guess that's it for me on Java. Cool. Should. I go then. Um, yeah, for Python, is that yeah. Alex? Yeah. yeah, this is Alex. Yep. Um, can I take control of the screen? Nate would have to give it to you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Before I move on to Python, just uh, have Wei and do a little uh, update on cat buffer stuff he's been working on from uh, uh, well, cat buff for Java and then the generator for Java and then um, uh, through the lens of kind of uh, testing against the peers. But yeah, Wayne, if you want to just give a quick quick update, you know, you posted some of the stuff on the sure. as well. Um, hi, so I actually um, met, I guess, Ravi today online, but um, I guess he'd be taking over the Java stuff. Um, so from the Java generator side, when I initially did the Java generator, um, I didn't make it compliant to either little ended or big ended because I figure uh, for automation it didn't matter. Um, but um, one thing I realized over the last week was that Java actually stored everything in big ended, so then it kind of break automation in any case. <laughs> um, I, I, I kind of figure most of the language store um, data based off the architecture which Java doesn't, Java sort it as big ended, no matter what platform you're on. Um, so because of that, I actually had to fix the generator to make it actually a little ended compliant. So it actually works with the CPP server. Um, so starting yesterday or the day before, I'm actually able to submit transfer uh, transaction using the automation code and the, um, and the generator. Um, Java generator codes. So I'll actually post the new updates over the next couple of days after um, I actually clean up the code. But I mean, using that going forward, we should be able to generate um, Java code that's actually compliant with the get buffer stuff. Uh, with automation, one thing which I'm looking at because uh, we're testing at the CPP server level and also at the, um, the REST endpoint. And I didn't really want to have two set of codes because from the SDK point of view, the code is the same except to what endpoint they talk to. The, the SDK currently talks to the REST, which is fine, but I want to create like a SDK that talks to the CPP server. And for the most part, they should be the same except for the communication layer. 
Um, so I probably work with Ravi on that since he's taken over for the Java side and see if we can come up with something. Um, and you know, the benefit which I'm hoping for is that we'll have test cases that will run both targeting the SDK and the, and the, um, the CPP server. So that's pretty much my update. Um, so Ravi, one question I have for you. Do you know what the changes that we need to make to make the Java SDK cow compliant or cow compatible? Yeah. Um, well, um, basically I'm kind of uh, looking at what's been done in JavaScript and sort of following okay. that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, if we can get a list of what was done in JavaScript, it should be pretty similar, right? Um, so, I mean, that's why I posted today asking if somebody could give me an idea of exactly what changed in JavaScript so we can see what work needs to be done in Java. But, you know, if, if, uh, if, if anyone else wants to contribute or wants to help out, you know, I'd I'm, I'm, I'm be very glad to, to, to work with, with them. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, go ahead. That's it for yeah, me. Uh, well, you know, I, I sorry. Um, because I, I'm I'm also quite new into some of the stuff that's um, in the SDK. Um, so it's kind of a bit of a steep <laughs> curve for me. Um, but I'm, I'm doing what I can, and um, that's um, so. Uh, I'd like to, I, you know, hope to be able to, you know, get into a call and discuss and bounce ideas and um, on the SDK. So I'd, I'd also add that um, Jag told me that we should have multiple people. Uh, from different places working on SDKs wherever possible. That like a single SDK shouldn't just be like one person's SDK, that it should be general open source contributors and that everybody should feel welcome to work on any SDK, basically. Um, that's for the better long-term health. Obviously, we have people starting off SDKs like Alex is working on Python or Benjamin is working on you know, Unity to get them kickstarted, but at some point we want as many people as possible contributing. So that would be nice. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, there's kind of like single point of failure, right? Like one person managing one thing and they go on vacation or change jobs or do something, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what happened with the NCC, our first wallet. We had a single person working on it and he left. <laughs> so yeah, it's always better to have more eyes on code. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, so like, also, oh, you can always re uh, reference the, uh, the JavaScript SDK and maybe ask questions from me and Greg. Um, I'm, I'm quite new as well, but I'm, I think I'm, you know, learning a lot through the past month. So, uh, you know, JavaScript and Java is pretty much similar, and the uh, the JavaScript one is using object oriented anyway, so uh, you should be all right. Okay, can you hear me? So basically, I want to give a quick update on the Python SDK, which I really started pretty recently. So I'm going to give a brief overview because Python's fairly different as a language and it has very strong ideas of how stuff that wants to be done. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about how I bridge some of those um, not conflicting, but like multiple design patterns um, to create an idiomatic interface and then also the state of the SDK. So just, uh, um, and everyone can hear me okay, right? Y yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Um, I'm also going to share. Um, so the repository is at GitLab, or GitLab um, Alex um, Huzag Nem2SDK. So if you want to see the code, 
that I currently have contributed, um, it's all there um, at this URL right here. Um, for some reason or another, I can't seem to paste it in the chat. Oh, wait, never mind. There we go. Um, so it's in the chat now if anyone wants to see it. Um, so quickly, just a brief overview of um, the like writing idiomatic Python. Um, Python has very opinionated ways of how to write code. Um, and so for example, in here we can see that we use the in operator to see if um, a key is in, um, for example, a dictionary or a mapping type. And we can also use, um, for example, indexing to retrieve that value. And Python provides um, methods which are used under names to actually um, provide this interface. And so specific types are supposed to behave in specific ways. And there's a fairly organized data model for how to do this. Luckily, Python has also made it a lot easier to implement a lot of these methods automatically using something called data classes, which is um, part of the most recent release. So if we create a class called address and we um, implement it as a data class, we automatically get a lot of these methods for free. Um, and so we get an initializer, we get a, re um, a debugging representation along with a lot of other things. So for the SDK, I've extended these data classes um, for most of our design goals. So that way the data is immutable. We have optional default initializer um, arguments. We can have pretty um, representations for debugging. We can support relational comp um, comparison operators such as equality and inequality. Um, we can support copying and we can replace individual data. So let's say we have like, for example, a block info and we want to just, um, or sorry, let's say we've got a transaction and we want to just change the signer and then create a new trans um, and create a new transaction because we've got multiple accounts. We can do that fairly idiomatically. Um, we can convert the data to um, native Python types fairly easily. And finally, um, just as a consequence of all this because of how I implemented, it, it was actually much more efficient than um, just naive, um, well, even regular Python objects. So I've got a quick example um, to a Jupyter notebook on how to do this. So I quickly just clone the repository. Um, and next, I, um, I define um, a simple class. So here's an example model um, doing, um, using um, my custom extended data class. Um, which is going to be mosaic properties. Um, so we've got the flags field, the divisibility, and the duration. And then, as you can see, I've got an optional um, parameter for the duration. So the default argument is zero. So I'm going to create property one, which is going to use that default duration. And then I'm going to create property two, which is not. Now, just to ensure that it's immutable, I'm going to try to change the data in the class. And as you can see, this is going to create a frozen instance error. So the data truly is immutable unless we try to do some fancy things, which is what we want. Finally, it's got great debugging representation. So if we need, um, if someone has something break in their code and they want to step through it, um, it's very easy. Um, all the comparison operators are properly implemented, and we can copy data fairly easily using native Python tools, which. Um, we can also convert the data to simple Python types. So we can convert it to a dictionary, which is like a JavaScript object, or a tuple, which is a thick size, basically list or JavaScript array in a way. Not really, but sort of. And if we want to, we can replace individual values. So here I want to change the duration from the property from 0 to 50. And here we have our new property. And as you can see, it creates a copy. Property one is not the same as property three. The data is immutable, but we can create copies fairly easily. And finally, here I just have a simple implementation that gets the size of the actual object. Here I have a naive class um, that basically has none of these or has none of these features and just stores the data as a naive type. Here I have if we had stored the data in a dictionary or if we had stored it in um, a tuple, which is a very efficient Python type. Um, and we can see what the actual sizes of these objects are. And as you can see, um, our implementation actually has the smallest size, even smaller than the, than the C, um, or than the tuple, which is a highly optimized C structure. So this is actually pretty nice, because all it took was a simple, um, a fairly simple extension um, using some relatively advanced Python techniques, but nothing very difficult. And we can write code like this that basically does everything for us. So it makes writing, defining, and creating models a complete breeze. 
now we're actually going to get into the models. So the general approach is that I want to have the same methods and properties as the JavaScript SDK. But because Python relies on initializers, um, we're going to have public initializers um, in addition to um, the static methods um, rather than private constructors. And um, like what was mentioned before, I'm going to support the conversion to and from the data transfer objects as well as cap buffer. The data transfer objects should be the same as those in the JavaScript SDK. Um, and obviously, cap buffer should be as well. And so an example here of an address object, this is just the help menu that I've um, exported. But we can see that we've got the is valid method. So it's in snake case, which is the default for Python rather than camel case. We have plain, we have pretty, um, we have two cap buffer and two DTO, although these are subject to change. And then we have the same methods as um, previous in, um, um, in the JavaScript SDK. We've got create from encoded, create from public key, create from raw address, and um, we have from Kappa for and from DTO, although um, I'm probably going to change those um, to different names soon. And finally, we also have various um, properties, which allow you to just do address.address .address or address.encoded or address.network type to get various properties from the actual class. So overall, the look and feel of the Python SDK feels a lot like the JavaScript SDK, except it's just more idiomatic Python. The same thing is true with um, enumerations, which I um, have many of the same properties. Um, so this allows this requires me to have Python 3.4 plus, but um, I extend them a lot using something that's called a mixed in class, which provides abstract um, attributes, but allows me to extend classes very easily. And to use these with enumerations basically requires me to use Python 3.7 plus. Luckily, this is also the same for data classes, so everything is using the newest and greatest Python. Um, and so this allows me to create, for example, a network type, which allows me to define, for example, mainnet, mejin, mejin test, and testnet, as well as also the two cap buffer, two data transfer object, and the from implementations as well. So here's a very simple example of how, for example, define a transaction doing this. So first, clone the repository and change directory there. And here I've got my data class for the transfer transaction. So as you can see, I just um, the so I've already um, defined a fairly simple transaction base, and this is how I'd go about defining a new transfer or a new transaction type. So here I'm going to go through an entire working transfer transaction um, and all that's required to implement one. So I've got my recipient field, my mosaics, and my message. Now um, I've created a default message, which is the empty message, and created an initializer. Now um, I've got sensible defaults for a lot of this. So for example, we might not want to have mosaics, and we might just want to have an empty message. And the signature, signer, and transaction info might not be known at the time. So here we have our initializer. Now here we've got our high-level um, static method. And in Python, it's generally better to use class, me class methods just because then you can pass an arbitrary class. Um, and it also makes certain situations a little bit nicer. So we can create our nice initializer similar to the, F, um, the JavaScript SDK. And this is just a nice wrapper around that. Um, then I, um, I have a simple method that um, calculates the total entity size. Um, this calls um, actually. This is missing something. Sorry. Um, oh, no, no. Sorry, this is not. So this calculates the entity size. Actually, sorry, it is. Um, so essentially, all the shared data is the same for every single transaction. And so I've implemented all the code there into the base transaction object. Um, and then the various other methods, such as entity size, are then implemented as abstract methods for the base transaction and then specialized within every single class. The goal was to um, mid or minimize the amount of code um, duplication. And so that way, we can then um, have very small amounts of code that are required to specialize each transaction. So here, 
as you can see, I calculate the shared size, and then I calc um, calculate the size of the fields that are required for um, each individual transaction. So the total size is then um, just a function of all of this. Then I um, need some specific code to serialize to cat buffer, and I use the field to cat, buff um, cat buffer specific, although this naming really isn't fixed in stone. It's most more so an implementation detail. So here I have all the specific fields, and I just simply pack them to um, little endian um, specific um, bytes, and then I just return this. Um, the, the base class will call both this method and the, sh um, the shared, and then create um, the entire trans um, serialized cat buffer um, object from this. Likewise, I have to implement the load cat buffer specific, and finally, um, normally I would define these in the class, but for the purpose of example, I'm defining them separately. So, sorry, I'm just gonna run them all. So I bind them here. And finally, here's just a simple example. So I'm gonna create my deadline. I'm gonna create my network type, um, generate my recipient just using the sample address. Um, I don't want to have any mosaics for this. I want an empty message. And so I'm just going to create a transfer transaction. And finally, I'm going to serialize it to cap buffer. And here we get our resulting transaction object, or um, cap buffer object. So here we have our serialized transaction um, prior to the signature or the signer. So that was pretty much it. That wasn't a lot of code, and um, it did a huge amount um, of functionality, which allows me to easily define new transactions um, and so the whole thing is meant to be very approachable. It's meant to minimize the amount of code required to generate new models, new transactions, and new transaction types. So in terms of the model status, I've pretty much finished everything except for a few specific transactions. Um, and I should be able to have those by the end of the week. So here are just a list of various transactions that I haven't finished, and I believe this is exhaustive. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is using async and reactive Xcode. So the JavaScript SDK um, likes using um, reactive extensions mostly because they're very nice. And the subscribe features and everything like that is um, are, allow for very idiomatic code. Unfortunately, um, reactive in Python isn't as well developed. So um, uh, and um, asynchronous code is a relative newcomer, but it has a lot of code developed around it. And reactive doesn't typically fit within um, the idiomatic Python that we were talking about earlier. It's it could um, it could in a few years, but right now it's not at that like first class citizen level over, um, that we'd normally speak of. So um, in recent versions of Python, um, it has native async await support. So a simple example of here is I define a generator, which just over a range of values um, is going to um, yield that value. Then I'm going to um, define an asynchronous function, which will convert this to a list. Um, and you can see the uh, what's basically called the list comprehension. So for each element in the generator, asynchronously, I'm going to get that value. And so then I'm going to just run this um, coroutine and generate to list. And as you can see, it creates a list of values from 0 to 4. Now I can do the same thing in ReactiveX. In fact, using much easier code, and it's um, much more powerful. But um, it's a different approach than what, what most um, Python programmers um, are used to. So how did I integrate the two? I want to allow the optional use of reactive style code, but I don't want to force it. So if um, um, Rx Python is installed, we should use it. But if not, we shouldn't force it. So to do so, I've um, added a lot of extension methods for RxPy to simplify our use case. And this allows us to create um, a, um, reactive observables from asynchronous generators and awaitable objects, as well as convert them to asynchronous it, um, iterators and awaitable objects. Um, there's, various, there's a few bugs in um, RxPy that don't allow this currently, um, as well as some of the features are just plain up missing. So luckily, um, the extension methods allow me to override some of the default methods and also implement this properly just in general. And finally, we use adapters to convert async IO code to observables. 
So for example, here's an example of using um, the listener protocol, which allows us to listen to um, using WebSockets to the, um, to the server for, um, for example, whenever like a new block is posted. So here I'm gonna async with the listener as listener. I'm just gonna wait until um, my subscription to a new block um, finishes. And then here for um, asynchronous for message and listener, I'm gonna print this message. So this will run forever and print every single message that's generated. Um, meanwhile, using ReactiveX, I've got the same code to generate the listener and I'm gonna wait for the subscription, but then I'm gonna do listener to observable and then I'm gonna subscribe um, to a um, anonymous function that will print that message. So the same code is there, but the main thing is that we have a function called to observable that changes an asynchronous function to a reactive observable if ReactiveX is present. So it allows us to interchange between the two very easily. If someone doesn't want the overhead of ReactiveX, they don't have to use it, but if they would like, to, um, but if they would like all the advanced scheduling features and the like, they can opt into it with, um, without much work. So how is this actually done? There's actually a simple decorator called um, add ob um, observable that does all the heavy lifting. So here I've got a coroutine um, and um, here I've got an awaitable object. Um, here I've got an asynchronous generator and here I've got an asynchronous iterator. All these are different types in Python that basically have somewhat similar functionality. The coroutine and the awaitable object basically do the same thing, but they're slightly different animals. And the asynchronous generator and the asynchronous iterator basically do the same thing, but they're slightly different animals. And the observable um, determines, um, um, or the decorator determines um, a, which one is the proper type and how to wrap it, so to create the proper observable from these objects. And so what it allows us to do is it allows us to just do two observable for any um, asynchronous, um, um, for any coroutine or um, asynchronous um, iterator, and then basically create the proper um, observable from it. So it allows us to um, use very idiomatic code. And finally, um, I'd like to talk about the client design. So the overall goals are to um, sort support both synchronous and asynchronous code. Um, support the same methods and properties as the JavaScript SDK, and to use context blocks to manage resource lifetime. The last one may seem a little bit odd, but it's very much so in line with what every other client in Python is doing. So it's going to lead to some slight differences um, with, um, from, for example, the JavaScript SDK, but overall the code will look very similar. So for example, for the synchronous um, API, what we can do is do from mem2 import client, and with client HTTP um, as HTTP, we can then get the network type. And using a bound property, we can actually get the blockchain HTTP using the underlying same connection. And then we can call get block by height. If I also want to, I can use blockchain HTTP directly and I can call the same method. Asynchronously, you can see that um, the only differences are I use async with. Um, for the properties, I call await um, before getting the result. And the same thing is true with the network calls. Um, and all the classes are prefixed with async. So that way it allows me to use both the synchronous and the asynchronous APIs in very similar fashion. And in fact, there's very little code. Um, there's, very, there's actually no, there's essentially no code duplication between the two. Almost all the code for the implementation is shared between both of them. Um, just um, um, they use different backends in a way that allows us to generate asynchronous or synchronous requests. So for the client status, basically everything is finished besides transaction-specific requests. Um, and um, these are all unit tested as well. And finally, um, I'll quickly get into the docs and testing. So for the documentation, it's built using Sphinx. Um, and so um, right now it currently has the API documentation, but later on it will also have examples in a tutorial. And here's um, a sample of the API documentation. Um, I'm gonna quickly switch over to the actual API documentation. And as you can see, um, for example, here for the client, we've got the class HTTP, which ha um, takes an endpoint. Um, then we can get the account HTTP from um, that actual class 
via property. And the same thing is true um, for a lot of other stuff. So all the functions, methods, and the likes um, and the like are documented using this API reference, um, which um, will be useful when pe if people have questions without having to dig into the source code. And the last part is for testing. Um, I have comprehensive unit tests with a large amount of data using mock requests. This allows me to rapidly test to see whether all the models are working properly and whether the actual functions work with um, mock data. Then I have basic unit tests with um, real requests, so that way I can actually test whether or not, for example, my connection data is working properly. So if I, um, so assuming that I get the right JSON data from um, get, um, block, get block by height, then I can create the correct block info. Now for the real request, I actually make that request to um, um, the Catapult server running on localhost. We also do um, static type checking via MyPy. Um, this required a lot of extensions to MyPy, but all those plugins are done and everything is passing and great right now. And finally, we've got um, style guide linting with um, PyFlake A. And finally, we've got feature documentation and test integration with Tox. So everything is all tested with a single command. I just type Tox and everything is done. So for the future work, all I have to do is finish the transaction models, which is mostly just plug and play at this point. Add some more tests to ensure all the transaction models um, and the HTTP clients work. And publish and add more maintainers. So if you'd like to be a contributor or you'd like to look over the code or you'd like to try out the SDK, please message me or contact me. Awesome. Thank you for... Uh fantastic kind of uh, overview and, and details of what you've been doing and kind of uh, overall goals. I know you kind of touched on some of the reactive stuff, both on Slack and um, and in the previous meetings, but it's good to see everything kind of coming together as you've been kind of working through and ramping up on, on your stuff. So uh, great. Uh, one thing, if you can um, take like a, a share link or something to this presentation and maybe just drop it in the, in the notes, um, that'd be good. Um, so people yeah. can um, I already added a link in there for the the GitLab repo. Um, just a couple kind of, I guess, you know, comments or questions or whatever. Um, so I guess on the on the documentation side, fantastic. Um, one thing is if uh, uh, I mean we can do it, you know, just on Slack or offline, and then in subsequent doc meetings. Um, but uh, coordinate so that any examples you do, um, maybe from a potential. Uh, prioritization could maybe match up with maybe you're already doing this, but with the uh, current examples that are in the main docs, um, and then where there's the kind of like placeholder that David has set up to where essentially you could kind of take your code examples and include them, so someone could be like, "Hey, here's the Python example, here's the the JavaScript example, etc." Um, be good. Again, it's not something like we don't have to do this tomorrow, but in the subsequent weeks. Um, as you're kind of getting more stuff together, um, maybe kind of have that mindset so we can um, get some of those main examples into the core docs as, you know, as stuff's maturing to a usable state. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. One of the things that I've been trying to prioritize is also that my tests pass various tests that are present in, for example, the JavaScript SDK. So I want to make sure that, for example, I am fulfilling various tests that are present in other SDKs. So adding examples and the like would be a major priority for me as well. Great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we kind of, we've, I mean, nothing's hardened yet, but on both the testing and the documentation um, meetings, we, you know, we were talking about how we can use documentation, not just examples, but documentation in general, examples are part of it, as well as tests, coverage, for uh, a certain amount of scenarios that, um, again, kind of unofficially set the bar for supported SDKs that meet a certain quality. And so it's kind of like, hey, if these three SDKs pass the same kind of scenario suite and have a base set of documentation and examples, then, um, for instance, at one basic level, that's great. At another level, um, some of that stuff, especially testing, right, can be put on like a CI loop. And so any commits on branches and stuff can be like run against that suite. And while you're not, 100% always guaranteed it, it's, it, it will lend itself to a, a very high degree of certainty that like the quality will be there if there's any uh, changes and pull requests that are merged in, so that'd be good. Definitely. Uh, 
That's also one of the things is that for CI work, um, I also have mock requests is because um, especially when you're working with a server, for example, a listener, waiting for new blocks to be published or waiting for new, tr new transactions to be published is a lot of work um, or it takes a lot of time. And so being able to mock the request with expected data and then testing that everything works and then just um, checking to make sure that actual real, um, real requests work with a single piece of data allows me to basically test everything. So I think it allows me to rapidly fire off a comprehensive suite of options and then also make sure that everything underneath also works as expected. Great, yeah, yeah that sounds good. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, I think those are kind of the most immediate questions. I guess anyone else have any comments or questions for Alex? Also, if anyone would like to get um, a jumpstart on the SDK or has any questions or would um, just has any suggestions or even would like to provide naming suggestions, all of those are more than welcome for me. I'd love to help out. Awesome. Anyone else have any kind of comments or questions? Okay. Well, yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much, Alex, for for the details and the overview. Um, yeah, it would be great for especially people that couldn't attend just to review the presentation and, and the recording stuff after. Um, so yeah. Uh, I, um, I can okay. also save um, the I or the Jupyter notebooks if um, if you would like, and then I can publish those if anyone's interested because that just shows um, with the um, output what the actual examples will do. Yeah, that'd actually be good if you either, you know, throw those into the repo or something or, or like a gist or whatever. Yeah, definitely. You know, people can kind of just, you know, consume um, as, as they go. Definitely. Um, just one second. I'm just updating the notes with your other link. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, um, so yeah, so that was actually, I guess, um, so that was kind of like, I guess, the core kind of updates uh, for J JavaScript, Java, Python. Uh, we talked a little bit about the versioning. So now I guess let's just say we're in kind of like open discussion or question time. So if anyone has any other comments or questions, or if there's anyone else on here that's either, you know, looking to help out on one of these existing SDKs or you're, you are interested or starting to work on some other language, anyone want to kind of just, you know, speak up or not? Um, you're kind of in like open discussion time, I guess, um, and closing time as well. Sorry, uh, Java SDK has been covered? Oh, oh hey, Shintad. Um, yeah, yeah, so, um, uh, so uh, uh, Ravi had kind of given an update um, on on things, and then uh, Wei and also spoke to um, uh, uh, the cat buffer stuff that he's been working on, and some of the uh, uh, end to end uh, testing directly against the peers. So we kind of covered it at that level. Um, whether it's duplicate or not, if you just want to, you know, you, you can like chime in as well and just kind of give an update. Ravi had just kind of given high level. Um, actually, if I go back to the notes. They kind of just touched on, you know, work's continuing. Wayne's been doing the gap buffer stuff. Um, there's some pending pull requests. Um, I guess currently working on the mosaic and namespace split. He kind of talked about that. Um, he had kind of thrown out there, like, without committing, like, hey, you know, roughly maybe end of month. Jeff had brought up some questions. He had been asked from some uh, some people about, like, hey, when will there be a functional Java SDK? And Ravi kind of mentioned, hey, you know, maybe end of month. We'll start getting enough Cal features to where it's usable. Uh, again, we maybe don't have to have 100%, uh, but enough to where it's mostly functional for basic transactions. So that, that was the level we had kind of like reviewed. Um, anything else you want to add, even if it's duplicative um, from the previous stuff, I, I guess go ahead and we can, you know, you can chime in now. Yeah, so basically I think a lot of the time has been spent on cat buffer. So initially we were trying to get it from uh, 
SDK level, there are no need to the Python code. Whereas I think Weyon has contributed the Python code. So what we did was take his code that was generated from the Python code and now implement it on the SDK. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of changes to the SDK because of that. And we're just really trying to get it all together as soon as possible. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably what uh, Ravi has mentioned. So initially, Ravi was working on the Nancy's mosaic split, but then after I've been working on Cat Buffer for quite a while, I said um, a lot of the things that he's going to do is going to change because of the way Cut Buffer is. So I got him to kind of stop doing what he was doing to help with the Cat Buffer. So we're trying to just get whatever has been done from Cat Buffer to SDK and hopefully uh, change most of the SDK changes. To, to be cat buffer friendly and eventually uh, have everyone be able to use the SDK. Okay, nice. Um, cool. Anyone else have? Uh, hey, yeah, thanks for the additive updates. Anyone else have any questions, comments about anything we've already covered, or new languages, or just API SDK stuff in general? Um, I could put Benjamin on the spot. He's looking into Unity SDK. Um, Benjamin, do you want to talk a little bit about what your thoughts are on Unity? If not, you don't have to. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're just fine. Um, it's, I've mostly been doing architectural work so far. So I'm trying to take a test-driven development approach to it just to avoid some of the issues that I've run into previously trying to do NEM stuff with Unity. Um, and that way I can make sure that it's everything is working on native devices all the time. Um, so I've been getting that put together, figuring out my test suite and planning out the cat buffer. Um, so I'm going to be getting into the code actually tonight is when I was going to start generating code. Um, but so far, from everything I've been able to plan, everything is looking good. And I've got a pretty solid idea of how I'm going to move forward on it. Um, I know that there's been a lot of talk in Slack about, well, I guess not a lot, but there's been some talk in Slack about the C sharp cat buffer. And I just wanted to make everyone aware I, I really think we need to have Unity have its own cat buffer um, set up just because by default, it's using C sharp seven instead of eight. And Unity is historically way behind. Um, in fact, the C sharp seven just came because they're releasing it in beta for 2019 um, in about a month or so, I think is their plan. So just so everyone's aware, I don't know. Not sure what you want to know. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. I mean, just good from a, you know, a knowledge standpoint. I mean, again, so some of this will be, I mean, kind of what, I mean, for those of you that have been on the previous meetings if for the API group or any of the other meetings, um, I mean, so the, the, they were kind of, uh, let's say, advocating is um, the, trend is, the trend is and will be slowing down going into and out of Dragon. Um, mm -hmm. And Hopefully, we're going to be getting pretty close, like from Dragon to Elephant and beyond, where things are mostly additive versus okay. you know, changes. And you know, we had big breaking changes uh, around assets and, uh, and aliases and stuff. Yeah, I think we talked about that in the last meeting. Yeah, so like that, that kind of turned slowing down. So we've kind of been saying like, hey, okay, here's, here's the deal. Like we're trying to get a footing and a certain like sane approach for kind of testing across everything. Um, it's pretty clear we're using the JavaScript SDK as kind of the beacon and the guiding kind of uh, quote unquote supported one that we kind of at least set the bar with and then the other ones will catch up and then hopefully stay at that same level as much as we yeah. can really keep them all together. Um, that being said, uh, cat buffer stuff is kind of going to be the updates are kind of almost uh, new and additive for all languages. So like the JavaScript SDK um, is even though it's been kind of the leader, it's actually going to be going through its rewrite. Um, 
so with all this churn, I think, you know, it's good that you're kind of like, you know, starting to dig in, writing some tests, uh, bringing up things like with the generator and, you know, maybe the targeted version for C sharp and whatnot. Um, so I think those are all good things. And then we're hopefully we can create an environment where it's, it's painful, right? Like, so onboarding on the formats and cat buffers and the APIs and what we're doing on testing, it's all kind of churning at the same time. So we're hoping mm -hmm. that, um, each language, as, as all the languages are advancing and each new language comes on, that it gets easier and easier. So hopefully you can draft, um, you can draft quicker than, you know, Alex is drafting on Python and the Java people are updating, <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 that's hope, sure. right. And so, so part of this, besides actually getting something functional uh, for Unity is just hopefully um, you can provide input and guidance on like, um, Hey, you know, again, you know, stuff around cat buffer generator and, you know, obviously help out wherever you can, but some of it might just be providing input on, you know, what works and what doesn't as far as like knowledge transfer. Um, yeah, so obviously for sure. um, has been cranking away for a handful of weeks now um, and just kind of presented, um, you know, kind of his thinking and understanding uh, based on ramping up. And, you know, he like brought up the question earlier on, oh, well, it seems like there's some naming things going on. So I'm doing that in mind. So let's try to make it cohesive, you know, same type of thing, right? Like you yeah. being here, you heard that. So as you get to write, you can kind of like mentally draft that. We haven't like documented those things per se. That, um, those docs are going to be getting updated as well. But let's assume that with limited resources, things won't be perfect. So it's definitely good for people to chime in, um, help out where you can, but also help direct, um, you know, the every additive SDK um, hopefully makes every subsequent one presumably easier from a process and an onboarding perspective. So yeah. Yeah. And you said kind of makes sense and sounds good. Um, I was going to ask with the cat buffer stuff, I may have just missed it somewhere, but do we have any kind of um, standard as far as like, I guess an interface for how the cat buffers should be functioning? Cause what I've kind of been doing, is I grabbed the C++ one and then I grabbed the Java and the Python branches and looked and I was like, okay, well, these are kind of the methods that I'm seeing that are the same. So I'm going to base mine off that. But I didn't know if there was any kind of standard somewhere that I should be following for it. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't have uh specific um again these are all kind of like additive now um yeah guess, and that's fine i just wanted to make sure there wasn't one before i just pushed forward on that path yeah, yeah i guess actually let me see is uh Wayne, if you're still on um i don't know you can get me to speak to your experience since you've been kind of going through it as well the past you know couple of weeks he still be on uh, I can add a little bit. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Chintan. Yeah. So uh, I think I've spoke to Jaguar before on this, and he said that I think C++ isn't exactly, uh, exactly a, uh, the code that you want to follow. Uh, he actually advocated the JavaScript branch, but that was before Java came about. So I think you can look at JavaScript branch and the Java branch for your guidance on how to work with the cat buffer. OK, perfect. One of the things that's been very useful for me, at least, is from the cat buffer repository itself, is just looking at all the structures. Because if you're used to C++ um, or like any fixed size type, like fixed size integers, and like for example, like a character type, you can pretty much figure out how everything lays out and how to actually work with the like cat buffer, like how the actual layout should be. Um, for like a new language. So for example, like if you take a look at like the co-signatory modification type, it's an unsigned 8-bit integer, which basically tells you everything you need to know. Um, and which has just been super useful for me at least. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything that I had. Um, I'll have some visible progress by the next meeting. Uh, like I said, I just my focus so far has been making sure that the architecture is right and that I'm 
approaching this the right way before I just go ham on the code. Um, Cause I mean, especially being involved with dev slopes for the last year, there was a major focus on just rush, rush, rush. And I don't want to make some of the same mistakes that were made with this SDK as uh, the same mistakes I made with the last one that I started to do for catapult. Definitely. Yeah. And of course also the, uh, obviously the project as, as updates have been coming and, um, everyone's kind of, you know, I don't want to say best practices, but obviously like for instance, we're doing a rev on the, on the JavaScript SDK just based on what we've learned and the current mindset looking forward. So I think all of that's good. Mm -hmm. like the fact that you, you know, have some background knowledge and went through some, some iterative process before and then kind of learn from that as well as what's going on currently on the new SDK efforts. I think it's all, it's all good, right? It's all additive. Yeah. Um, but hopefully again, incrementally kind of, we get some inertia on, on these languages and everyone again, hopefully the drafting helps. That's the hope and the goal, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, anyone else, uh, comments, questions, other topics? Okay, well, um, I guess we'll, we'll wrap. Um, and uh, tentatively kind of, I guess we'll, we'll kind of tentatively say for next week, but um, as the next you know few days and stuff go on, like for all group meetings, we, we usually are trying to say like, Hey, let's target weekly and then just cancel as needed. Um, we don't want to like burden everyone with having to attend so much, so many meetings, but um, it's good to kind of keep people in the loop. Um, so we'll tentatively try to have one for next week and then just reevaluate as time's going on. And if we don't need it, we'll push out to the following week. I know some people have already kind of uh, messaged uh, that they're traveling next week. So um, I will just, again, take that feedback and, and, and respond and the like. In the meantime, do what everyone's been doing, um, continue conversations and questions on the Slack, especially for you, Benjamin, and Alex, as you've been doing a great job on the Python stuff. Just post questions, push it on people to like, you know, get a response. Um, lots of different time zones and stuff, so people aren't on 24-7, but uh, we're trying to make it so there's a, a certain amount of gravity to get people there to help others out. So um, let's uh, continue the conversations there and then see everyone on the, uh, on the next meeting. Bye. Bye.